am Alexandra Cunningham. We have worked together on Aquarius starring David Duchovny. Now I do Dirty John, lately of USA and previously of Bravo. <laughs> and before Dirty John, you created a number of other shows. You did the American version of Prime Suspect. Chance. Before Dirty John, I did Chance on Hulu. I've consulted on Base Motel. I did Desperate Housewives for many, many years. I did Rome on HBO. Mm -hmm. And my first job was NYPD Blue, which is obviously a complicated memory. <laughs> 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 so I don't know what it was about Aquarius, but that was so much fun to work on. First of all, the writer's room was awesome. And then set was awesome. Yeah. I mean, Duchovny is like the gold standard for number one on the call sheet. Maybe it's because I worked in broadcast television for so long. I like to come up with insults that aren't curse words because then they can't make you take them out. Like if you say asshole, then they're like, we don't do that on ABC. So ever since then, I was like, I just want to come up with like Damon Runyon-y kind of like old school detective noir novel insults, like mushroom or, you know, I remember that. or, you know, that kind of stuff. And David just was super into that, would just be like, come up with some more of those. Sometimes in the middle of a take would be like, give me another one. And I'd just kind of be like, I, I, I don't... So coming up with ways to make your character sound in any way authentic when there's a limitation on the language you get to use, it's it's truly difficult. You can call someone a hammer toe and it's just as bad <laughs> as calling them a dickhead. You have a lot of choices out there. <laughs> uh, you can get around the curses, which, you know, since I really have spent most of my career on uh, networks where standards and practices are like, please remove, you know, mm -hmm. douchebag. On the shows that you do now, do you still encounter standards and practices notes or do you not? Oh yeah. There was a list that they sent us because I was like, what's the deal on Bravo? And you know, what are my parameters? And the very cut and dried list that they sent me of like, these are okay, these are not okay. It was, you know, basically like shit, shithead, ass, bitch, <laughs> ass bitch. But, and I was just like, ass bitch? I've never thought of that one. Like, it was really, and then it was like, you may not say, <laughs> fuck, the C word, blah, blah, blah. But I was kind of like, no, no, I'm good. I got ass bitch. You, thank you for that. I feel like you've had um, a career thus far where you've bopped around between wildly successful, very serious. Like, NYPD Blue was for the babies in the house, for whom <laughs> that show is ahead of their time. It was like a cultural phenomenon. They showed naked butts on ABC and, and used a lot of very uh, salacious words that then by the time I got there uh, in eighth season, they were not allowed to use anymore. You know, I have a very weird resume. Somebody just asked me about this the other day. They were just like, your resume is so, there's no positive word for like all over the place. Yeah, that like your, your resume is a lot of different stuff, which like now that I've been in the business for 20 years, it is now clear that was the point. <laughs> yeah, I want to ask you about shifting between mm. these different tones and the yeah. different skill sets of that, but probably <laughs> I, a, a wildly disorganized question asker, should first ask you how you got the first job, that very first job on NYPD yeah. Blue. Let's start there. I was a playwright, but at the time, that was not necessarily a move that was being naturally made by people. I went to Columbia to to get an MFA in playwriting because I had never written anything before because I thought I was going to be something else. I thought I was going to be a doctor and that clearly worked out very well. So I had to write a play to get into a writing program to try to study writing because I was pivoting. I was uh, 21 or two and I was pivoting. I had written a short story in college, which was basically the only real writing I had done at that point. And I submitted it to a fiction writing class as a senior undergrad and got into the class. But then the very famous visiting professor uh, told me to not write fiction. I know. First of all, I hear these stories so often where just somebody does happen to have the same strengths as the teacher right. and the teacher is like you're not good sometimes by the way it's like you're a little too good at the thing I'm doing I was like we trust teachers and mentors so much and they so yeah. frequently this has a happy ending though so you should keep telling the story it, no it totally <laughs> does and he I actually think that because I wasn't like fuck you you don't understand what I was trying to do or whatever instead I was just sort of like oh okay you know and I think it shamed him so he kind of went well your dialogue is okay you could write a play or a screenplay, but we don't have any of those classes here, so I don't really know how you're gonna do that, so, you know, get out of my office. And so I kind of 
thought about that and I was bartending on Fells Point in Baltimore. And so I wrote a play about, you know, a young woman bartending on Fells Point in Baltimore. <laughs> it was a real stretch. And then I applied to a, like a, such a random assortment of like playwriting programs. There was no thought put into it at all. They were all over the country. And then I went to the one in New York because I figured I would end up in New York eventually as a person trying to write plays. And my writing mentor was Laura Linney's father, mm. randomly. He was the best. and But the only students that he really liked when I was there were me and the co-showrunner of Perry Mason, Ron Fitzgerald, my friend of 25 years. So we were his favorite students. And he basically was like, what the hell are you guys going to do? Because you'll be terrible teachers. So you better be successful as writers because you'll be really shitty teachers. I'm yes. just going to point out that people need to make some calculated decisions about how much they're going to listen to other people. I thought I was going to have to be a casting director. I wanted to be a casting director because I assume playwrights can't make any money. So I right. went to work at Warner Brothers TV Casting in New York. And then I found out that Ron Fitzgerald, kosher runner Perry Mason, was in this program at Juilliard. Next thing you know, I got in. But that was uh, that was how I ended up at Juilliard. And that was a cool experience. It was That's super awesome. worth it. And then I got my agent through that because uh, agents came to see a showcase of your scenes being done by Juilliard actors. So stacking the deck for you. Uh, I got my theatrical agent through that and they said, are you interested in television? Which I think most people at that time said no, which is, you know, not mm -hmm. whatever. Everybody's entitled to everything. But I, I think they saw that as selling out at the time. I got into the business a few years after you, but it was sort of still the same. There were a couple of really, I think Six Feet Under and The Sopranos yeah. had ushered in like, okay, you can be a little prestigious, but it still was like yeah. mostly, you know, yeah. we wanted to be screenwriters. You wanted to be a playwright and yeah. And Steven Bochco, he had gone to Carnegie Mellon for theater and he really felt based on identifying other people who were not television writers and making mm -hmm. them into television writers such as David Kelly and David Milch and people who Stephen just thought I can tell from your writing that you can switch venues uh, that that is basically what he said to me that I feel like you can do this even though you haven't written a spec and then the first script I wrote was like 85 pages long. I had no idea how, I didn't know there was an actual length it had to be. I find this anecdote comforting mm. because you had no idea that like no if somebody idea. turned in an 85 page draft to me, I would be gentle because I would know that there was a, a pretty <laughs> a deep level of ignorance, disconnect. but I would just give it back to them and say, hand yeah. this back to me when the first number on, on the last page is a five. <laughs> that is basically what Steven did. He called me from his car on the way into the office and was like, hi, <laughs> got to talk about this script because it's like 20, 30 pages too long. So I just wonder, this might be a terrible question because there might be no right answer or there might not be no helpful answer, but if not, let's be honest about it. What would you tell someone who's like, I want to be a showrunner. I want to be a producer. I'm on a show right now that for whatever reason, you know, the room will be over before production starts or productions in South Africa. Maybe we can get into this and give writers who are inside that system, like something they have a little bit of control over which is just like, what do you think makes a good producer? What skills do you feel like you put at the front of your mind when you're in prep, when all of that stuff starts, when it stops being just best idea wins, funnest turn of phrase, coolest scene, you know, and you start to get into, you have to put this in the box of the show. Flexibility, a willingness to be open. The idea of, yes, I was married to this. I might still be married to it, but I, I am going to hear the idea of how it might be done differently and take that on board. And like, look, um, it's better to be honest. We should be honest with people. There's a lot you don't have control over in your career. And you get on staff, it's a steady job with health insurance, and there are also downsides, which is you don't necessarily get a complete and tidy education. Your your job gives you that job. It doesn't necessarily give you your whole career or a leg up on, you know, your next set of ambitions. We were massively over budget in season two of Aquarius, <laughs> like wildly over budget. And what ends up happening when you have gotten beyond 
the tolerance of the people who are writing the checks at the studio right. is you have to come up with ideas that just make the next episodes cost less than they were originally budgeted at so you can make right. most of it up. And right. so we were like a seven or eight day show and you wrote a script that could be shot in six days. And now yeah. for a one hour that looked that good, I, that is fucking unheard of. Like if someone told me I had to shoot you in six days, I might quit on the spot. It was great though. <laughs> But I think being a playwright helped you with that because you, you made it very bottled. Yeah, I mean, it was funny because this is more applicable to how a showrunner has to be both a writer and a producer. But this past season, when I directed for the first time, there was a lot of drama about budget and that kind of stuff. It kind of redefined that whole thing for me in the sense that this one day, we were shooting tandem units, which means the producing director had half our crew shooting one episode. and. I had the other half of our crew shooting. A, I'm not telling you this. I'm telling whoever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I was on location in Toluca Lake. And it was the first day that I was going to be directing an entire call sheet on my own. I had mm -hmm. done maybe four scenes total in other people's episodes. Mm -hmm. I had dropped in and, sh and shot a few scenes. And this was the first day that I was going to be alone with the entire call sheet, my own first AD, my own DP, uh, a crew I didn't recognize, a house where we could only be in four rooms and it was raining. And we had to do it in 12 hours. And we were being hassled by the studio. They were saying that we were massively over budget for the other episode, not the one I was shooting, but right. the one I had also written that was shooting at the same time. And they were like, you're gonna have to take eight pages out of it or whatever. And here are all our suggestions for the scenes that we should take out. And I'm like, wow, that's all the character stuff. You're leaving us with basically a court TV transcript. So I'm not doing that. And then they were like, well, we're gonna come to your and shut you down. And I'm like, okay, well, you'll be doing it in front of Christian Slater, so I dare you. So I'm sitting there and uh, the first AD comes to me and goes, so the studio says you're cutting the first scene. And I was like, no, uh, no, no, I'm not. And he goes, no, no, they said you're, you're cutting it. And I go, no. Right. So I basically was like, the studio wants me to cut this scene because they think the character's being a bitch, not because of the budget. Not that we don't have budget problems. They've always wanted to get rid of this scene because they think it makes her look bad. It doesn't make her look bad. It makes her look like a person. Uh -huh. So are you going to serve their agenda or are you going to follow me, essentially? And he was like, oh. So then we were fine. From then on, because he goes, they would do that. And I'm like, they would do that and so much more. You <laughs> raised so many things at once that oh, wait i should answer the question because i was telling this whole story to answer the question yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So i was like how are we going to finish this in 12 days when they're already calling my first ad on his cell phone and telling him that we're cutting a scene that we're not cutting right. so i looked at the sides for the day and i was like we are going to cut the upstairs scene we're going to make all the days because we we're going to go to night i'm like we're not going to night anymore so they won't have to pull anything down they won't have to take time to do that it's all mm -hmm. going to be day we're not going up Upstairs, we're going to record Christian Slater and Rachel Keller in a van doing it as voiceover. And then I also am going to like move this around and I'm going to pull this scene up from tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like, so check me, Lex, don't like spell me to see whether any of these things are wrong. Like, am I wrong that I can make all these day? Am I wrong that I blah, blah, blah. And he was like, no, I think you're fine. And I'm like, okay, then as showrunner, I deem it so. We're doing that the on the day, like, on your yeah. first day as a director, is some yeah. mega baller shit. So I just want to highlight what you're saying, all of the little gems and jewels that you just said, because there's a lot that people can pull from this. Because here's a little exercise people can follow along at home. If beyond wanting to just like see your scripts produced by somebody, if you also have aspirations to be in the trenches in the way that you're describing, there are people who have that kind of personality. You and I very much have that personality where we love to solve problems and we feel like most alive under pressure and crave creative control also yeah. you know let's say you have someone like that they're young they're ambitious or they switch careers and they're ambitious and they are finding themselves on eight episode orders where they never get onto set like the thing that you're describing is like a fundamental flexibility about how an idea is executed Right. So like the germ of the idea that day had everything to do with like Amanda Pete is playing a character and Christian Slater is playing a character and a certain something has to happen between them for the story to work and for you to express this thing that's in your heart about the story. And there's a hundred million dollar version and there's a version that's two sock puppets in Washington Square Park, right? <laughs> right? 
being shot by an iPhone. Both tell the same story. Mm -hmm. And so we do this to a certain extent in the writer's room too. And people might not identify it as producing per se, but like I have that cap on most of the time. So that's a gauntlet that people in writer's rooms that I'm in usually have to run anyway, where they say, you know, and then they're racing a train. And I'm like, and if you can't have a train, what is it? Yeah, yeah. Yep, then they're yep. racing a truck. And if it's yep. snowing that day, then what is it? Essentially, what I'm saying is we learn by producing, we learn to exercise the part of our brain that starts to see pieces of this story as yeah. like Legos that you can yeah. stack up in different ways. And you can pull right. one out and put another one in and the structure will still hold. And you can still prop up what you want, which is the emotional, delicious goodness of yeah. what's happening between your characters, yeah. which is how yeah. you did a six day episode. You were like, yeah. this is what I need to cover me character to go through and I'm going to lock him in a room with some people playing guitar. I'm going to teach him how to play guitar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, the truth is that so much of our job, so much of my relationship with you over the years when we're busy is just me texting to complain that I have to kill <laughs> more darlings today because we're over budget or you saying like the same, right? So we give each other moral support and then you go back in the room and you cut the stuff. It's like being a showrunner in that middle budget range is going like, yeah, like I really want this sweeping romantic thing where they're um, on the circle line and they're, ha they're having sex in the middle of the day. And it's like, but my brain is already going. And if New York City won't let you shoot there, then yep. where can you shoot them? How do you express sweeping in a place that doesn't cost $50,000 a day? To me, that's a huge amount of producing. And I would go even a step further and say, like, if you want to make yourself indispensable in a way that word will fucking get around um, between jobs and when your script lands on Alex's desk and then Alex calls your last boss, that person will be like, oh, you should hire her. It's because you're thinking like that. When you're, right, when you're writing the script, you're not asking Asking for a spaceship to explode en route to Mars in every scene, you're thinking about how to make these things modular in a way where they can be scaled up and down so we can kind of pick our battles. That kind of exercise, I feel like, really makes you iris down to what it is that you actually want to write and say. Mm -hmm. with this scene. Is it about the explosion? Like, is it about Air Force One exploding on the tarmac? Or is it about, you know, the emotions being expressed between the two characters? Because if you can figure out in advance how to make something actually producible, because anybody can place anything anywhere and have all kinds of amazing production elements. And I wish that for everyone who's watching. Mm -hmm. I wish you that budget and those producers and that world. But when they tell you you have to put it in a room between two people then you really need to figure out what it's about and also if you can anticipate that if you can figure out how to tell your story in a producible way it really reduces the odds that somebody's going to try to take it away from you i mean like, that's is... not people being mean yeah. that's business right so it's sort of like why don't you make it producing proof especially if you're like watching this and you're in development and you might get your own show soon right but just store this on a post-it in your brain until then. Like the story you just told, your ability to be able to save the stuff that the powers that be do not prefer, that is totally reliant on being a producer who is responsible. It's like staying on budget is why I've been able to tell pretty much every controversial story I've told in my career. It isn't just like- Defend yourself. Cause you're kind of like, well, yeah, we did have a problem with a script that was too long or a script where we dropped a location and like, you know, that, yeah, that you, you have to make yourself is the, was the word you used undeniable? Is that what it was? It was, it was something like that, but it's just like, that's a good word. That, that would be advice to writers who are trying to get this experience on an eight mm -hmm. episode order. If there is no prep or production happening when you're in the writer's room and you do have the ability to show up at the office and not be paid and be like, can I listen in on a concept meeting or a production meeting or whatever, that that is what I would try to do is to make your writer's room experience so positive for the, the showrunner that then the showrunner is like, yeah, okay, you can shadow me in these meetings where the first ADs tell me that this day is unmakeable. That's the only way that you're yeah. going to get the confidence in the absence of the experience you and I were able to have. That's the only way you're going to get the confidence to be able to make these decisions on the fly. I will also say, for the record, it's not fair that the system is set up so that people have to, you know, go do a bunch of stuff and not get paid for it. Like yeah. in a perfect world, you're on staff and you're paid for all of this stuff, but we're just telling it like it is. And shadowing usually 
you have to figure out a way to cover your own ass to be yeah. able to shadow. And that's, that's true for most directors who need to shadow in order to, to be considered for episodes. Frequently yeah. they're shadowing on their own dime. And that's also true for writers, um, including myself who wanted to follow episodes after they were technically on hiatus. One thing that's special about you is that you've sold several shows. So you are a veteran of the pitch circuit. I think it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about how much of the show you need to understand and what you need to know before you can pitch an idea to an audience in a way that can make them understand what the show is and want to buy it. Why does this show need to exist? I totally it's understand and empathize. people need to figure out what the marketplace is looking for. I totally get that. You want to sell. Everybody wants to sell. But if you sell a show because that's what the marketplace wants and you don't know why you're telling it or why anyone should be telling it because the studio's not thinking about any of that, they think you thought about it. So then if you didn't think about it and you get into doing that show and you don't know what any of that is, that's when we see all these shows where we go, why is this show? Would you give us the log line of why you want us to do Dirty John? You know, because I had read all of the articles that were in the mm -hmm. LA Times before the podcast started. There was a series of six articles, and that is where I saw Deborah Newell's picture, and I was like, well, whoever does this show, Connie Britton should play her. And then the podcast came out, and then I listened to that, and then my agents at the time called me and said, do you know what Dirty John is? Which I don't know that they knew what Dirty John was, but... <laughs> I did. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we represent the LA Times and they want to do a show. And I said, okay, well, I'm doing it. Then I went in to the agency to meet all of the executive producers who were already attached to it. And so I sat down and we we're all talking and then they turned to me and they go, so how do you plan to address the fact that millions of people on the internet called Deborah Newell a stupid bitch? And I was like, well, I plan to address it by ignoring it because she's not a stupid bitch. I want to tell a story about how everybody wants to matter. Mm -hmm. And it's also a story about coercive control, which is, you know, what we now know domestic abuse to truly be in all of its many varied and horrible forms. But also, also, you know, it's really a show that I can manipulate the theme that I always want to use, which is who are we and why do we do the things we do? But All I do want to talk about your actual literal sit down and typewriting process. Although I think oh, you yeah, yeah. do it longhand sometimes. Yeah, I do. When did I start doing that? I feel like I started doing that like eight years or so ago. I And until that point, I was always like sort of weirded out by people who are like, I write longhand with Ticonderoga pencils and a yellow pad by a roaring fire with the black and I'd be like what yeah, I'm just like, I don't believe this. It was always someone who you could tell was trying to sound like Hemingway. And then I was on script for a show that I was consulting on. And I had done some procrastination, mm -hmm. uh, which I can be prone to. I had said I was going to turn it in like on a Tuesday. And it was Saturday. And I had some of it, but not enough to feel good. And then my daughter fell off the back of the couch. And she has a, a shunt in her skull. And I think she was three-ish. We go to the emergency room. It was one of those days where you show up, no one's in there. We get a room and then it immediately explodes and there's like gurneys in the hallway. And I had a notebook. I sat in a chair next to her bed in this room in this, because I was like, this is crazy. It's Sunday. I said I was going to have the draft on Tuesday. This is all going to turn out to be nothing, which is something I was telling myself. And I won't have a script and I'll have let down my friend who is counting on me. I can't not do it like get on it so anyway I'm there all day and she's in the bed and people keep coming in and like you know can we touch your stomach does this hurt blah 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 take her to x-rays they can't find anything they never found anything it was nothing you guys it was nothing point was I was like, I, I gotta write this until somebody says, hey mama, we're taking her to surgery or whatever. I gotta write this stupid script. And so then I had like three quarters of a script in this notebook and I was like, huh, that's a thing I didn't know I could do. That's kind of handy. And I never it, tried that. It's just snowballed since then. I write at the car wash. I write sitting in the waiting room at the doctor. Like I said, like, cause it, you can really just be like, just do this scene. I don't write an order. Like I can't write an outline linearly. I, people who can do that, I please tell me how, but mm -hmm. I can't do that. And I will bounce around and I will have the cards 
somewhere in my home or in my office or both. And I will put little post-it notes on the cards as I finish them. And then when they're all finished and they all have post-its, then I will frequently revisit them over the next 36 hours to get an endorphin rush of accomplishment. I've never written longhand. I might try it. I, I do a similar thing to you where when I have an outline, I number it backwards so that it's a countdown. Yeah. Even if I, you know, jump around, which the longer I do this, the more I'm like you and I'm non-linear in, in how I write a script. I get to cross the number out. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, just 10 more to go, just six more yeah, to yeah, go, yeah. Just four more to go. But um, being home is challenging, right? Not being able to put fresh stimuli into your brain. What do you do now that you're home? Because we might be like this for a bit. I mean, this is my office where we're at. So I just kind of sit in here and you know, I put the headphones in. I make the playlists. But I, I really have only since COVID started, I've only written one script for the show that I'm EPing. And since then, it hasn't been an issue. It's going to start being an issue. Um, do you play mind games with yourself to get your yourself to write at home. Just what are your hacks? One thing that I do love about writing longhand in the notebooks is that that's like the first draft because then when I transcribe it, I rewrite it as I'm transcribing it. My one hack is that I, at the end of the day, I, I try to write something so that I can start the next day by having something to transcribe so that I launch immediately into working as opposed to launching into opening the notebook to the empty page and starting a new scene. It's like, well, I have a thing that I left off on last night a scene that I wrote but didn't transcribe so I can use that to get into the headspace and then by the time I'm done transcribing it I can then transition back to the notebook and the first draft and that's been very because I am a person who needs a shove you know I mean I do I work in the mornings and I work very early in the mornings and all that I have that part down but then like the actual like no you don't need to look at the newspaper of any kind. You woke up to work. These are all like mental hacks to like feel better about where you're at. Like you can also do this thing where when you're transcribing the scenes, you can fold them over. And then mm -hmm. in the end you have a whole notebook full of folded over thing. And it's like a weird achievement. This is a Dirty John Betty Broderick notebook. And it's very like, mm. see how crazy it gets. And then everything mm -hmm. gets like scribbled out and then numbered like in the order and like the I mean, it's crazy. It's like looking inside the mind of a crazy person. But so you don't have to like make it look pretty. You can just make it look nuts and like start over so many times. There you go. Pretty. There it is. It's just, but these are just room notes. And my notes are frequently like just really bad doodles. So writers who are at home, broadly speaking, are watching this. I'm imagining, you know, what we call the pre-WGA writer, someone who is becoming very serious about their craft and wanting to break in. And I don't want to embarrass you by tooting your horn, but I know that you mentor a lot of writers who are working to break into the business. What kind of advice do you find yourself giving people who are figuring out, you know, the specs that they're going to write or, or other aspects of breaking in? Well, here are two things I can think of that have come up recently the idea that for so long there were only original pieces of material being submitted probably because people like me were like I like to read a play I don't want to read your spec of whatever now that it sounds like people are being asked to write specs of existing shows again mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense to me because I feel like it only is a value add to somebody without experience of being in a room to really hammer at television vision story structure because really if you think about it we all think we're HBO writers right we all think we're we don't need to write for commercials we don't need to write act structures that lead you into commercial breaks we're gonna write for HBO like yes mm -hmm. given you are going to do that when you don't do that there's gonna be commercials because everywhere except for like HBO and Netflix has commercials like maybe stars doesn't have commercials I don't know but FX does Hulu does all of these great outlets it only behooves you to learn what it means means to have to try to keep someone's attention, even in a world where you can fast forward through commercials. It's just an important skill to understand so then you can throw it away. Doing the show that I'm doing right now, the showrunner and I, it's a show for Apple, there's no commercials. We broke it with a five act structure. Mm -hmm. You'd never know that. If you were watching it, you don't yeah. know. You just know because of the wonderful planned spooling out of the storytelling through five acts that, that helped us like keep a handle on the structure, but do it without them. So yeah. I mean, 
it took me years to be able to say this in a sentence because I didn't ever go to school for this per se. I mean, I learned by reading scripts. Nobody was explaining narrative arcs to me. And it took me a minute to be able to say in a sentence that to have a scene for television, you need conflict. Just character, just atmosphere is not a scene. And what I mean, my first job, David Milch said that, that he said, every scene, everybody has to want something. I but do then the other thing I was going to say was that I found really interesting that somebody asked me in one of these Zooms, they said they had been told that to do well in a writer's room, they should take an improv class. And what did I think of that? And oh. I had never been asked that before. And so I had to think on my feet and I was like, you know, I actually think if you are truly honest with yourself, yourself in a no one else is listening it's just me inside my brain mm -hmm. if you can evaluate yourself and truly say truthfully that you are a person who listens and doesn't wait to talk then you don't need an improv class if you are a person like you have to be ruthless with yourself about this which is why you need to do it alone if you're a person who waits to talk mm -hmm. then you need to take an improv class to be successful in a writer's room because an improv class will teach you to listen. I always think it's a really good idea to take an acting class of some kind, just so you understand the language that actors speak. Yes, if you don't feel comfortable around actors, that might also be a good reason, but you might not need to do that like to be a staff writer. But there are many showrunners out there who could use that class because, you know, yes. there, there are many showrunners who are scared of actors. Don't be scared of actors. That's No. That's just, when yeah. you're writing a script, it's like, how do you say this in a language that's the language of action, yeah. not the language of experience? expressing an idea, but the language of people behaving and interacting. And that, you can get that in a one six week course. Yeah. And some actor just heard this and was like, how dare you? It takes a really know, long time. But the basics of- Trying to do what you do. We're just not trying to do, what you do a little better. There's the thread that underlies what you're saying right now that also goes back to a lot of the anecdotes that you were telling about just different aspects of your job as a showrunner who's directing your own material, all of that stuff, which is that like, if you're a writer and you're saying to yourself, all of these TV writers seem to own their own houses. Like that seems like a good corner of the writing world for me to try to get into. It's like, I think it's good to be honest about the fact that you have to have a certain kind of temperament and constitution as a writer. And you have to be fundamentally accepting of the fact that you will never, ever, ever be in a place where you don't get notes yeah. on everything you do. That the cost of being well paid or having like steady income, more or less, as a writer, yeah. that cost is not low. What you're describing requires a lot of fortitude and like sucking it up and telling your ego to shut the fuck up so you can do something you don't necessarily agree with at that moment artistically. And like, you get notes every day, you've been doing this for 20 years, you worked on a lot of Emmy winning shit, like if anybody deserves to just be left alone, it's you. And you get notes every fucking day. But honestly, also on the flip side of it though, sometimes when you hand a draft in, you know it has weaknesses and you're just kind of hoping, you know, that either no one's going to notice them or it's a thing that you really love, but that you know is going to be confusing or like whatever it is. And when someone puts their finger on that, it makes you angry, but it's a different kind of anger like when someone's just giving you a stupid note. Like when someone one hits on a like, I don't know, I was confused here. You also have to kind of be the person who realizes that like, yeah, it's not the worst thing in the world to go back in and do a polish based on trying to make sure that as many people as possible understand what you were trying to do there without compromising yourself. You can look at it again. You could. Maybe yeah. you'll come away with it and go, nope, can't make it any clearer. Sorry. Like only people who get it are going to get it. But sometimes it's mm -hmm. kind of like, all right, there are notes that will make your script better. You just have to figure out how to take that note in a way that feels organic to what you're trying to do, because that's the part they don't understand. So like, yeah. if you can take those on board, and again, there are going to be people who are going to regard me as a, you know, a hack because of this, but like, I like to take as many notes as I can possibly take that don't make me insane with mm -hmm. their stupidity. And usually they are about clarity. When there are notes that are about clarity, I'm like, I'm not in the business of trying to confuse people. I'm in the business of trying to tell people a story that I want them to follow. Like you're the opposite of a hack if you're venturing beyond the previous limit of what you've already executed well. Like right. if you have the ambition to do something you haven't done before, then you're figuring it out. 
because you're not a hack because you're trying something that's challenging you. And then it's like input is necessary in that process. Right. for most of us. But uh, no, this has been fantastic. I feel like we barely just scratched the surface and that we should just have a podcast, me and you. Like, <laughs> I totally people, agree. People can call in and ask about whatever, just ask questions about things. Yeah, if we did a call-in show, that would be super, that would be helpful, I feel like, to people. Look at me dragging you into my schemes. I just want to no, help. But honestly, like that really has been through this whole pro, because I don't know what people are dealing with right now. Like in terms of trying to break into the business, it's been too long for me. Like I, you know, I can talk like a, a dinosaur, like a, all they want, but like, help me, help me help you.